Welcome. Great going. Let's, let's get started. Sorry, I was having far too much fun on break. Okay, this, uh, this chat for session is called Untangling the Minimum Viable. Just real quick, who uses MVP as a term at work? talk about sort of what, I've, what I'm hoping uh, to impart during this and definitely ask, ask questions. So, so my own background real quick, 20 years in product management originally in med devices and diagnostics, and then came out to Silicon Valley from East Coast and got involved in early software as a service. Spent a decade with 280 Group consulting tech companies. I mean, the great thing about consulting is you see so many different contexts. And one of the big messages coming out of this talk should be context matters. Ah, so that's a real fantastic thing because people will hire you as a consultant where they would never have hired you as a product manager because you don't have domain experience. It's the strangest thing. Ah, so you do get to see a lot of industries, a lot of context, and uh, more recently, I also been doing consulting under my own banner, Agile Excellence LLC, which was the name of my first book in 2010. I recently released strategy excellence, which was just to address the issue or what I saw as an unintended consequence in the Agile world, that teams were taking too much advantage of the flexibility of an Agile team and not doing the hard work of the strategy plans. For this presentation, I kind of want to take a look back historically at what this term MVP is and how we got there and some of the different definitions that exist in the marketplace. So I'll start finding out what definitions uh, you, you are all using. Understand, in my mind, what a minimum viable product is or, or what's essential about that term, and then providing a framework for team validation and MVP testing. I'm going to start with a little quiz, which was, does anyone know who said this? Test your way to rapid success. Anyone want to take a guess? Steve Blank, good guess. It is not Steve Blank. He might have said this. <laughs> Anyone else? Come on. We got books on the line. <laughs> if you can deposit any guess, even Mickey Mouse, you can earn a book. There we go. One of the LinkedIn founders. Oh, like Reed, Reed, what is it? Yeah, Reed Hoffman. Hoffman. It was not Reed Hoffman, but he might have said that. He might have <laughs> said that. Thank you. Tom Computing. I'm going to give you some more hints. Uh, this person also said, when any idea surfaces, ask these questions. Where are you going to test it? When are you going to test it? Can't you test a piece of it sooner? Can't you do the first test in less time? Can't you chunk it more? What did you learn from the test? Zuckerberg? Jeff Sutherland. Got Zuckerberg. So that name's familiar with this. No, Jeff, the Jeff founder of Agile. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Um, you know, Jeff Ken Schwaber. Yeah, Jeff Sutherland. Yeah. It was. You got all like great guesses. Mm -hmm. Not that. And you know, not. Not Tom no, 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 not not Zuckerberg. Not Zuckerberg. Eric Reis. Eric. Eric Reis. That was the obvious one, but it wasn't Eric Reis either. This gentleman, <laughs> Tom Peters. <laughs> He wrote this in 1987. Wow. <laughs> and the question is, my God, if he wrote this and documented this in 87, with these words like time to first, tangible test, try test adjust, speed up innovation by dramatically increasing rates of failure. Where have we all been? <laughs> or Eric Reese comes along and codifies everything as, as, as Lean started. Right, in these methods, and we're like, oh yeah, that's obvious. Um, so I think one thing to take away is the ideas we are applying now aren't terribly new. They've been around for a really long time, but certainly the way we can do it, and I think one of the real changes that we saw with the Lean Startup moving and being online is what we could do in the area of behavioral testing. That just wasn't possible to these companies in 1987. And just for reference, uh, Gary Hamill from 91 describes a very similar ideas here on something called expeditionary marketing. What do you do when you're going out trying to create a market? 
And he was talking about traditional companies releasing products and best in class. The best in class companies could get a product out in a year. The traditionals were three years. So just give you a sense historically how far we've come and now how quickly we can get things out and test. If you're in this online internet kind of, you know, web 2.0 or web 3.0 now world. So I have got exposed sort of to some of these ideas. It was not in 87. It took me another like 13, 14 years before they even hit my radar. It was during the dot com and I was working for a company, Idea Lab, which was a, a very high flying successful dot com incubator. And that was like my first exposure working in an office where the walls were half the height and you've had a lot of rich communication going on. We adopted an agile method of extreme programming, which was totally eye-opening to me. And, and we had this concept. Does anyone know how to know, know when spaghetti's done? Against the wall. Throw it against the wall and? If it sticks. See if it it's sticks. Done. done, yeah. So that's what we called MVP, was this idea. We used this commodity Intel hardware. That brought our cost way down. And we wrote stuff, and we put it out there. And you threw it against the wall. And if it stuck with the consumer, you, you were moving in the right direction. Forget how many years go by for, from this, but Eric Ries comes along and just does this brilliant job codifying this in what he calls Lean Startup. But this has, starts with this idea of build, measure, learn, this Lean Startup loop. At the heart of it is the scientific method or the attempt to make innovation scientific. I don't know if for some of us who have experience in other areas like design thinking, this in product management, where we start in the problem space. Right, this, the build the idea of building first was a little troubling, although they've kind of changed their tune on that. But you know, we do core discovery first, where we have scientific method in here, design thinking is this very human-centered approach. And all of these have you know, huge value. Um, so realize there, this is a method to have in, in, in your toolbox. And it has a lot of great ideas, but it, you really get power when you start pulling multiple things together. Now, the point in history that I want to focus on is 2009. Because there was this amazing change that happened, or this interesting change in my mind. In 2009, in March, Reese describes the minimum viable product. I'm going to read from the slide here. The minimum viable product is that product which has just those features and no more that allows you to ship a product that resonates with early adopters some of whom will pay you money or give you feedback. And I think the key thing to understand here is, it shows up here, you are building a real product in this definition. You're gonna test it with real users, so we're gonna do that behavioral side of things, and then you're gonna iterate quickly. By August of that year, and I think here what was going on is, is Eric Reese is responding to the way people are applying this build, measure, learn loop. And they're doing things like smoke tests. Let's just put up a website. We're going to pretend the product's real, and we're going to see who's going to click through and buy it. So he redefines MVP as the minimum viable product is that version of a new product which allows a team to collect the maximum amount of validated learning about customers with the least effort. And we get this change. MVP is no longer a product. It's an experiment. It's still behavioral, we're testing it with real users, and we can still iterate quickly. That part of the model and loop is the same. But this opened up the door, and I think a, a really significant change that has created confusion when I work with teams, is that all of a sudden, almost anything could be a learning experiment, right? An MVP just starts sucking up any kind of technique it can out there that we might use to crank the learning wheel and cycle. So just real quickly, who here in, in their organizations does MVP refer to an actual product? I don't know, maybe not, not quite half, but let's see who raises their hand on the other one. Who is an MVP in experiment? We got a couple. Okay. So this is one of the confusions I think going on in the marketplace. Now I'm going to be arguing and debating very passionately that MVP should be a product. But it's okay if you don't agree with that. What's really important is that you and everyone on your team agree what the definition is. And then I think you do need to have a name for 
what it is when you actually put a product out there, and we'll talk about why in a moment. So I don't feel like I'm trying to convert you, but I do want to raise awareness around this, this confusion and, and the significance of it. So that gets us down to lean validation. And I think at a minimum, when I look at all the methods out there, this is really what we should be looking for. Very similar build, measure, learn, but we're in product management, we do discovery and we do validation. And like Lean, yeah, the faster we can crank the learning loop, the faster we can get to a product market fit. Traditionally, the order we move in is this. We go out, we understand the market. Is there a need out there? We go out and validate. Do customers have this problem? Is it urgent? Is it interesting? Will they pay to solve it? Then we might go do some kind of concept testing. That could be a smoke test. We could show them a prototype and we try and perceive is there value in what we're showing them, right? And you'll see that in design thinking as well. And then at some point, we gotta put the product in their hands and see does it deliver value? Right? We know they perceived it, and in this middle one, they said, yeah, that sounds interesting. I think that could be good, but in the third year, realized value, we're actually seeing do we solve the problem for them. Uh, and that's why getting, uh, for those who raise, raise their hand, right, that MVP is just an experiment, getting to this one, realized value is important. You've got to actually prove you can deliver it before you know you're truly on to something. Now, there's this fork in the road about how we go about these stages. And there's two ways. You can do what I call belief testing, or you can do behavior testing. Let's talk about what those are. This is someone's New Year's resolutions. OK, has anyone ever written out a New Year's resolution? That's or do you know someone who did? <laughs> OK, you don't have to talk about yourself. And just how many people know someone who had a resolution, like exercising and getting fit? and maybe didn't actually follow through. Okay, so this is belief testing, right? We go out, we talk to customers, and we say, what's their belief? What do you believe, right? We're trying to understand fundamentally what's important to them, what do they believe, how are you gonna act? Now belief research certainly, uh, I will say works better, or, or there's more correlation between what someone believes and what they will do in the B2B space than the B2C space. And that's important to know, and we'll talk about a couple of examples of that a little later on. But that is a belief test. This is a behavior test. This is what happens when you leave someone in a room alone with a bunch of cream puffs, right? And if you ask them what they would likely do, they probably would not have described this, <laughs> right? They just said, I'm probably not going to take one anyway. I'm trying to get fit, or maybe I'll, I'll, I'll eat one, right? So this is behavior, and we have much more confidence in behavior. When we know can say this is how people actually act than in belief in that research, but both are useful. So I created something called the key question chain testing grid. Key question chain is a method I have for working the fastest path through the learning, the validation. This is a piece of it which has six main quadrants of different types of tests you can apply and and where in the process to pull them out based on your context, and context is important. The top of the grid, sort of on the horizontal, right, that's that three chevrons I showed earlier, going from needs to perceive value to realize value. And then we just split it, behavior tests that we can do in belief tests. Now the big thing is, as much as behavior tests are totally awesome, because we actually know this is what people do, Behavior tests answer the what. They don't answer the why, which is why you want to make sure you're doing both. You want to make sure you're getting to people's underlying motivation so you can pull that human centeredness, right, putting them at the center of the process, and design better solutions based on that information. And these are just a couple of sort of example things you might do. There's many more that can that fit into each of these boxes. But behavior, we can just observe people and what they do. And whether that's B2B, I go and sit with them and shadow them for the day, right? Or we sit at coffee shops and see what consumers do or walk into stores. These are things we directly observe. We can also just talk to them and say, hey, what are, you, what are the problems you're dealing with? What's frustrating you? How can you rank this set of things you just described? What's most important? We can do things on perceived value. 
I would ask customers for pre-orders or actual purchase of a concept I was thinking of developing. Well, if someone's willing to put down money, you know they perceive value in the solution. Right, that's much better than them just telling you, yeah, yeah, that looks good, I, I would probably buy that if it came out. So pre-orders are good, Ash Miori has, uh, who writes eloquently in the Lean Startup space, that's something called the offer smoke test, that is a value proposition, a demo and pricing to see how people react and behave to that in those sort of behavioral tests. Also, there's just like, God, the age old, I don't know how long it's been around for marketing, right, but the concept document. Let's just go in, let's go with the document, describe the product, and let's see how customers react to it and what they say about it. Or you might go in with some sort of wireframe or prototype. Those are all perceived. They're telling you whether they think this looks like it would deliver value. And if it's down here, it's in the belief, because we're not actually asking them to take an action, whether it's signing up, giving us an email, or buying or something. And then finally, we get to realized value. That's where, in my mind, MVP needs, why I think it needs to be a product, because you don't really know you have something until you can prove that you deliver the value, not just that the customer perceives value. So to me, that's in the upper right, but if an MVP means an experiment for you, you need to come up with some language to describe what's in the upper right of this box, because that's where you want to march to. The other ones are things like renewals, right? If a customer renews their subscription, you are probably delivering value. The problem is it's a lagging indicator, right? Unless you're just hoping they don't recognize you're going to renew it and it just auto-renews until they cancel. But usually, you know, if the customer's going to sign up, you know that you got value out of your solution. We can also do the belief stuff, going in satisfaction interviews. We can do net promoter score. Those are usually not useful until we have a trend line going on. So those, again, are, are lagging. Customer interviews can be real-time about, are they driving value for your solution? So for practical definitions, this is how I define an MVP. That's what I'm going to read again. But the smallest product that will meet the need of a narrow user segment. So we're talking about early adopters who are usually in acute pain because they're willing to struggle through this early version of the solution. And for which the user has exchanged value to use the product so that you may learn from real usage. The best value is money. Uh, but if they're actually going to commit a lot of their time to looking at the solution, trying it out, there's opportunity cost. Like that is a sign of commitment, much different than just going in and doing a concept interview with someone. And when I say we'll meet the need, my definition of need is down here. The user would rather use the product as it is than wait for the enhanced release. Which means you are taking away more of their pain than your immature product creates for them. Like that's the acid test. Okay, will they use it? It doesn't mean they'll stay on your solution if you don't continue to enhance it, but they're getting enough value out of it, they will use it as is rather than wait for it to get better. Then for me, sort of the experiment side, I call an MVP test. It has to be behavioral, and as I said, it's a test. You're usually doing perceived value testing at that point. Any questions? Okay, these, these are all big concepts. Go ahead. Um, Two questions. One is, um, if you're copying a product, right. what is the MVP then? You're copying it? A, a type yeah. of product. Yeah, if you're copying a type of product, what is the okay, MVP? So if there's then? expectations in the marketplace about what this product is and what it needs to have, and you're going after the same target user, the MVP has to be a much richer product. So. Tough, right? Someone else has set the threshold and you're entering as you know, a second, third, whatever, four. Now you take someone like Salesforce, okay, I'll go back early on, they're going after Salesforce automation. So they targeted a new business model, a new way to distribute it, as we learned from Michael Eckhart, a mid-tier customer in very specific niches. But feature-wise, like they, they knew what M MVP was, right? They knew what Salesforce automation was, and it couldn't be the right still had to be a reasonably rich product because they were competing with on-premise solutions in that market. Uh, and the so, does that make sense? Yeah, that makes okay. sense. Yeah, something a richer copy of. A now, or, right, or you know, I, th I mean, if you're going down market, right, it doesn't have to be as rich. Or it's kind of a dated example. Um, what was it? Do you remember the flip camera? Oh, do I remember this? The, the, the smartphones killed it because it was just <laughs> as good. 
But this company came out with this little camera that was about the size of a smartphone that you could take video on, and it totally sucked. The battery life wasn't good, the resolution wasn't good, but they nailed two things. Those things that camcorders that they called portable, this thing you could put in your pocket. Right? And that was a pain that consumers had. And they figured out the main thing consumers wanted to do was share videos. Camcorders were these like jails. Videos went in, they never got processed and shared. So they made that stuff really easy. Right? So for them, they're not, they're, they're creating a new segment in the market. So their MVP was actually a pretty crappy camera, but that did really well in these two dimensions of portability and shareability. And those were dimensions that traditional camcorder folks weren't even competing. Sorry. Right. Second question is, um, from your experience, what's a really quick MVP in recent years, and what's a by by uh, by an MVP product? Yeah, yeah. Sorry. And what's a what's a what's a quick MVP experiment? Hold that question because we're going to go through a bunch of case studies. Okay. Okay. So let's loop back to that, and hopefully I'll hopefully get that answered. Uh, so just in my mind, you're just finishing off sort of definitions and, and language. For me, MVP is the upper right. MVP test would be those behavioral tests of perceived value. Everything else, this is just good old-fashioned traditional market research, still delivers amazing amount of insight and value, particularly in understanding the, the belief side. So let's talk about case studies. Now, I used to uh, start this talking about one of my stories before I was working in a new, new marketplace and the, the setup took so long, kind of would lose people to try and explain what we were trying to do. So we're gonna go with Zappos. Anyone know this company? Okay, what do they do? Shoes. Shoes. They sell shoes. What makes it, them unique or made them unique when they launched? Customer service. Well, customer service. What were they doing that was different? Oh. Yeah, take it back, more basic. Shoes online, right? They were telling, selling shoes online. So first off, do they need to go out and validate whether people are going to even wear shoes? <laughs> no, I mean, kind of sorry, rhetorical question. What other people will exchange money for shoes? No, that's pretty well established. But they do have this issue that they're going to try and sell shoes online, right? And shoes, ultimately, it's kind of an intimate purchase, right? You traditionally go into a store, someone sits down with you. You try them on, you walk around, two shoes that might be size eight aren't actually the same size at all. There's all sorts of challenges with buying shoes. So they had this big behavioral problem. Would people buy shoes online? And does, does anyone know what Zappos did for an MVP? What kind of? So, so they went to a shoe store, and they said, hey, would you mind if we took some photos and put your inventory online, and every time someone buys a shoe, we're gonna come down and we'll pay you whatever, you know, your list price is for it, and we'll ship it off to the person, and the shoe store owner said, yep, that was fine. So they, basically, they, did, they didn't like create a warehouse, they didn't carry any inventory. What they did do is figure out, how can I, and this is to your question, right, most quickly figure out, will people buy shoes online, What's the average order size? What's the return rate on these things? So they immediately, and I think very sensibly, jumped quickly to the upper right. But the only way I'm really gonna answer this question of how people are gonna behave is to go out and see how they behave. Right, so they figured out the simplest way to put up a site and measure behavior. Uh, and didn't need to raise huge amounts of money to do this testing. Now, I'm hoping they did go out and at least talk to users a little bit to see what anxieties you'd have about ordering online. But you know that if you ask them would you or wouldn't you, we probably couldn't trust that, right? So we needed to jump immediately to an MVP, real product in the market really looking at behavior. Now let's look at a, a very different example. This one uh, came out of my time at Instill. We did supply chain solutions in the food service industry. But we had big customers like Subway Systems, Applebee's, Kentucky Fried Chicken, uh, all the young brands, Pizza Hut. And we mostly did purchasing data. But our customers had a pain point around these things called LTOs. And I shouldn't show this slide right before online, line, should I? <laughs> Everyone's getting hungry now. Uh, LTOs, limited time offers. These are the sandwiches that show up for like a month or two months at a time. And 
consumers have to wait a whole year before they come back so they can race to the store and, and get this limited time offer. And managing inventory on those is hard. And at this point in history, there was a mad cow disease scare in the US. And pretty much everyone, and I'm exaggerating here, but stopped eating hamburgers and all switched to the chicken sandwich specials and LTOs. It wreaked havoc through the supply chain. And to give you a sense of how, how, how that world works, just for grounding, there's like some manufacturer or producer like Tyson on chicken or Heinz on ketchup there on the left. Things go to distribution centers. Do people know the original Cisco with an S that drives around in these big trucks? Okay, so they go to like Kraft or whatever, or Heinz. They pick up giant pallets of ketchup and they break those pallets up and mix it in with the chicken that came from Tyson and they deliver it to the individual restaurant units. So that's how this supply chain happens, right? You have inventory in sort of three different places ultimately in this system. And our clients, this is what they started having to do. <coughs> they would talk to their distribution centers, the Cisco's, and they'd ask, how much inventory do you have on hand of whatever the ingredients were for these limited time offers? And this would be fax and email. They'd spend the whole week chasing them down. They would get a signal, finally, of what inventory was and how many days on hand of this inventory they had, and they would start deciding, do I have an issue? Do I need to switch stock between distribution centers? Do I need to go back to the manufacturer? Do I need to reroute? Do I need to limit how much inventory a restaurant can have so that people aren't hoarding and doing other bad behavior? So they talked to us about this challenge, and, and I went out and started talking to my customer, doing something called contextual inquiry, contextual research, understanding what my customer did, what the pain point was, what their process was, what kind of reports they were looking at, what they did with this data, what decisions they made with this data. Then went out and talked to customers and said, you know what, we, we can do better because we were already getting data feeds from these distribution centers. We can collect that automatically for you. We can do it daily, uh, so you have a much better sense of a signal. And is that interesting? I mean, we sold two of these before it was ever built to our customers because they were in a lot of pain around this. And then, uh, sorry, from your, in the back of the room, your name is? You're asking about MVP contacts? Oh, Eddie. Huh? Eddie. Eddie, okay, so this is a very different example. Right? We, 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 we didn't fake it, like Zappos did. We actually built the product, but we built a really thin slice. So we had daily feeds coming in to us. We were automating that. We put our reports in our standard reporting infrastructure. And then release two was like, okay, why do you have to go in every day to check dashboards? We'll just alert you. You just tell us the rules of when days on hand drops below this, I'll send you an alert. <coughs> So you don't have to be monitoring it daily. So that was, you know, really thin slice of value initially, which was collection daily and report, just simple reporting. We had some value added fields on there, so they didn't have to do additional calculations. Second one was alerts. And then we talked to them about uh, how that was. So let's talk about this versus Zappos. Does anyone know sort of what a concierge MVP is, which right, some more Zappos was doing? Where you're pretty much you're, you're faking things. It's a question, it's like, would it have made sense for us to have faked this versus building it? Right, should I have had my staff calling DCs, getting this data, and like sending my customers an Excel spreadsheet? Yeah, was, okay, why? I, I mean, that you, you, you do it manually, mm -hmm. Uh, on the back end, you, and and just put put people to the problem for now, and to just prove the concept right. without building anything, uh, and and try it out. Okay, so we got one for yeah. Anyone for no? Yeah, I think I think it depends on how much effort it's going to require to be able to automate. Yeah, okay, that's, that's a good point. What's, what's the cost? If it's, if it's pretty simple to just pull it in, mm -hmm. or if they give it to you in a sim similar format like CSV or something, you just read it in. Then right. That may be faster than mm -hmm. calling and hunting down every day for a week, or however long you're going to put this trial on. Yeah, yeah I will say this was it probably took us 90 or 120 days to build. Okay, we're going to have the final last book, so thank you for, for answering that tough question. 
So the reason why we actually decided we're gonna build this, right, is, and not do it, is, is a few things. First off, my customers already built the MVP. They were already running the manual process. So we knew that it delivered value to them, right? Because if it didn't deliver value, they would have stopped doing this process, right? So the real test was, yeah, sort of was more technical. Could we get the data? Could we increase that frequency to daily? Which we weren't going to do effectively without automated feeds. Uh, so this is where, in my mind, context matters. The other part is because my customers had already built the MVP, right, there was already a workflow in place, and I could go in and use, call it contextual inquiry again. Do the research to really understand how their process works, and in the first release, I can tell you, the issue, we did not have issues in the product, right, because it was an environment where we could understand what customers were doing. Um, with great fidelity just by doing this, this much more traditional research. You know, very different if you're putting out a new app and you don't really know how people are going to use it. Like Twitter would not have been able to interview people and understand how people would use that product. Right, you can only learn that in the wild. But on the B2B side, in this case, you know, we're, we're automating an existing process and there's ways we can improve it. Um, you can really understand it very fully and build with much higher confidence and not need to nearly have the same frequency of feedback. Now, we went back to customers before we built things and showed them the wireframes and made sure it would support their workflows and showed them the reports we were going to create. Um, but we certainly didn't need that kind of weekly back and forth, back and forth, back and forth to hone it. And we also, this was going into an existing user interface. We already had our interaction design figured out. People knew how to use our product. They knew where to find things. Right, so that was all defined. We weren't experimenting with any of that. Um, so context matters a lot about how you're going to slice your, your MVP. And one interesting thing, too, about why I still feel MVP is important is we actually wanted to say, well, you know, why do you even manage inventory? Why don't you do vendor-managed inventory? Let's open this up to, you know, to the Tysons, to the Crafts, and the Heinz. They were not yet comfortable enough to even want to do that. So we didn't build that early, and had we built that early, that would have been an overinvestment in product. Make sense? Okay. So I think that's really important. You know, and the sort of when you read books and things and learn about methods, often context is left out, and you really got to understand your context, what you're trying to do, and then apply sort of the theories and principles of it. Uh, just real quick, this is an example, Alienid Systems, this uh, was from Frenomics Cowan, they sold this to Broad Software, which just got bought by Cisco. They wanted to make provisioning enterprise VoIP services simpler for telecom carriers. Problem is to do VoIP in those days, and probably still today, you had to provision like five to seven different systems so that it all worked and people were in the right directories, and this was really painful for telecoms. So there, First thing they did, and they were a self-funded startup, they sold a consulting engagement to see about just streamlining the process. They had industry experience, so, so they had cred in this space. Their first product was just a software script, a simple software script that a system engineer had to run to populate the various systems. And that was successful, but they, did that, you know, they sold it. Both of these they sold, so they knew there was value there. After that, they started to develop the interface for it, gave a UI so you could, um, someone who wasn't a systems engineer could input data and manage it, and also validation for any import files. And finally, they started to see how to scale this. Telecoms all have unique infrastructure, all have unique requirements, so they needed to create a real sort of clean API levels so they could handle custom work without having that interfere with the core product. And their path through this was very much this consulting agreement to understand the space. They did deliver results. They knew those results were good. That led them to selling the software script, once again, a perceived value test. And finally, implementing now through a bunch of very, very thin releases. I mean, you know, think that your first product, your true product, was just a script, and they could sell that? Like that that's very impressive. And really, you can't get much more minimum than that. Uh, so that's landed systems, once again, different, slightly different context. The one case which I find really fascinating is GE. 
So they have adopted lean startup methods. They have their own thing called FastWorks. You will see this through you know, the appliance business. You will see it in their healthcare business. You will see it in their jet engine business. Uh, they, at the top of their mind, is the monogram line. Used to take years. Working product in three months. They launched it in one year. There were 18 revisions to it, and they update this product line yearly rather than every five years. Really big changes uh, to how they operate. What disappoints me a little about GE and the case studies I've read about them, uh, both in healthcare and in appliances, is they're really stuck down here from what I can see. They do rapid prototyping. Once in this what isn't a terribly new idea, and like for that monogram line, they put the fridge in the showroom, they brought in designers to comment, and they got like all this awesome feedback around it, but it was really just in the perceived value space, and also really just in the belief space. Uh, not so much taking that product, really putting it into service somewhere, and doing realized value out of it. So I think they can go a, a lot further. But in constrained environments, and actually like healthcare is one, you can't necessarily go just put things out there, right, into the hospital and see how it works. <laughs> you gotta go through approvals and regulations, then you, often this is as best you can do, right, is perceived value. So let's uh, wrap it up, we've got a few more minutes here. So MVP, so, so I define it as a behavioral validation. It has to be a realized value test. That's important, we've got to prove that not just does the customer find value in solving the problem, but can we deliver on that value? And then you want to do the thin slice so you can continue to improve quickly on it and understand their usage. As I said, you may have a different definition, just make sure that your team all shares the same definition so you're all speaking the same language. And then figure out what that final realized value test is. Also, know what kind of testing, right? Which space are you testing needs? Perceived value or realized value? Understand what the strengths and limitations are. Are we testing what? Are we testing why? What are we trying to get to here? And then uh, to go back to Tom Peters, he wrote test fast, fail fast, adjust fast, which I like to sort of restate as test fast, learn fast, adjust fast. We want to get to realized value as fast as we can and really confirm we can deliver it and then understand the issues customers are having <coughs> extracting further Questions? We got uh, five minutes left before lunch. So just yes. to reiterate, um, so um, realized value is they're willing to put money into the team. Is that so realized value is the upper right. Upper right. Yeah. Okay. They should have given us something like money. They and but they're using the solution and they're getting value out of it. Um, and also, we can do like realized value KPIs. So one of the famous ones was like Pinterest. Value wasn't, oh, hey, look how many people signed up. It was getting people to pin. When people started pinning, they got value. That's why I considered a value action. I think in Facebook, it was you had to connect to like 15 friends. And if you didn't do that value action, to get the actual social network part working, like to have a network, you weren't going to get value out of the solution. So they spent a huge amount of time on the early onboarding, getting people to find friends, right, and connect to them. Does that answer? Yes. Okay. Are the slides available? Um, how things are at this point? My understanding is yes, and the claim we're being videotaped. <clears throat> but I don't know where the camera is. Maybe, oh, maybe it's up there. Yeah, okay. And then these videos will even be available. Oh, but okay. you can grab a card too. Just feel free to email me. Okay. Well, slides if they don't become available or questions which might emerge. You yeah. showed the matrix, right? The, the yeah, chain. the grid, right? So is there, a, is there a guideline around the order in which you execute? Because there's behavior, there's belief, and there's perceived and actual. And sometimes you could parallelize some of these mm -hmm. versus doing it in a serial fashion. What would yes. be the guideline there? Yeah, that's a whole nother topic. It's a great question. I mean, the first thing to take away is context matters, right? For me at Instill, going out and doing contextual research was the fastest way to understand the problem. 
break it down and with very high confidence be able to deliver a solution that would work. I mean, Zappos, I think, really did make sense to jump to that upper right quadrant. Let's figure out the fastest way to test this in the wild. When I was at Idea Lab, that was the same thing. Throw it against the wall and see if it sticks. Because we were doing something new, there was no reference point for it. We couldn't even, have, I mean, there was one other company in sort of the market space that we could infer some stuff from, but most people weren't using the, these solutions. Um, so it was just new territory, in which case, I guess if it's doing something new, mm -hmm. you really want to get to an MVP realized value test a lot sooner. Okay, if you're improving current process, you can learn a lot with traditional discovery and research. And then it was funny, I mean, I, I usually like always like to go at least ground myself in the problem space, talk, go out and talk to customers. I want to do it, I, I can in their environment. Um, but I was with the client, they actually had a really hard time getting access to them. Um, so typically I would ground myself and then I might do a survey. So the short interviews is qualitative research, it's opinion research, we're understanding when you're doing interviewing the variety of opinions in the world. But the fact that if I interview 10 people and three of them have the same idea does not mean 30% of the market believes that, right? So then you go out and you do a quantitative study to see how prevalent a certain view or priority is. But for this customer, getting access was really tough. Surveying and just you know, incenting people to take the survey in the market was pretty simple. So like they reversed that for you. And, you, know, you, you had to do some open-ended questions and infer from that, but for them it was easier to go out, do the survey, understand some stuff, and then target their limited set of real in-person interviews more tightly. Um, and that's why I say context matters. So if you don't take one thing away, that's it. Okay, let's get out early, so then you can grab the Fox lunches before they're all gone, or like whichever one you want the most, okay? I'll be here for a few minutes. If you have another question, feel free to come down.